Hi everybody, it's Kerry here at the Northeast Autism Society and today we are going to be ex discussing exploring autism throughout the years and I have with me um, the lovely Quinn Dexter who I've actually just met for the first time about 10 minutes ago so I don't know too much about him but I have seen that he's got some wonderful videos out there on YouTube and, and his channel. Um, so hi Quinn, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, nice to talk to you at last after few conversations on Facebook. Brilliant. I mean, I, 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 the reason I came across you, Quinn, is I was Googling, as I do often, um, and I came across some brilliant videos that you've pushed out on your channel. What's the name of the channel? Autistomatic. Yes, because I didn't want to get the pronunciation wrong. So, um, yeah, so I think that's the first thing to say to people watching this video is go and check those videos out. Um, because I've seen them and actually um, set about finding Quinn and having a conversation with him because I thought they were, they were very insightful. So, um, yeah, so Quinn, we're here. Um, could you just give, tell us a little bit of information about yourself? Okay. Uh, well, as you can probably tell by the beard, I'm no spring chicken. Um, I'll be 50 later on this year. Um, I was first diagnosed as autistic back in 1984. That was a good seven or eight years before the autistic spectrum was formally acknowledged uh, within the DSM and the ICD. Um, I was very lucky that the psychologist that I saw, it was an educational psychologist, um, thanks to probably a story I'll tell a little bit later, um, who identified me as fitting the profile that he'd read about um, from the work in particular of, of Lorna Wing. Um, he'd got this idea that the difficulties I was facing, the things that I was finding difficult in life, and the, shall we say, behaviours that my school had highlighted related to this Asperger type autism. And so my diagnosis back then was autism brackets Asperger type. Mm -hmm. um, from then on, um, I found out more and more about it over the years and led to where I am now. Um, a couple of years ago, I faced a, a personal crisis related to my being autistic. Um, I said something which upset somebody and it caused me a hell of a lot of trouble. And when I explained that it's in my nature to be honest because I'm autistic, they didn't believe me. And it caused a hell of a lot of trouble. My whole life was turned upside down. And I started to realise that whilst I'd hidden behind a mask for most of my life, really not opening up to very many people, that there was an awful lot of aggravation out there, that people were being really badly treated. And I'd kind of insulated myself from it. So I engaged with the community again, saw what was going on and thought, well, here's an opportunity to use what I've learned and skills that I've got that I know not everybody shares to be able to try and give something back. So I've spent the last couple of years on the channel and writing in various places and the occasional uh, bit of public speaking mm -hmm. to try and help people understand that, that the accepted notions of autism, this whole triad of impairments, the whole deficit model we have, is not the whole story. And whilst we are a spectrum, there are all different kinds of levels of ability and communication. We are at the core of it all, still human beings, we're still equal, and we still deserve the same kind of treatment, even if it's not so easy to communicate with us all the time. Absolutely. I think something I talk a lot about is misconceptions around um, autistic people. Um, you know, one of my ones that often talk to families about is when it, people say autistic people don't want, uh, don't want friends, for example, and actually that's not true. I've got, some people don't want friends. Some non-autistic people don't want friends either. But um, I've got lots of autistic people, children, young people that really do want friends. It's just they might experience that in a different way. So in terms of misconceptions, um, Quinn, which have you got a misconception about autism that really kind of, you know, you really would like to educate people about is the one that one that stands out for you? I've got to be honest, I, I, it's very difficult to isolate it to one particular issue. There are just so many. I mean, the one that you've highlighted just then um, is a huge issue. One of the last videos I did in the social media series I recently finished was about that subject, mm -hmm. that autistic people, as a rule, do... Oh, kicking my camera there. Um, okay. Do, as a rule, want friendships. We do want to be loved. We do want to be in relationships. If there's one subject in my work that I've been asked to cover more than any other, it's how do I find a partner? 
How do I find somebody to love me? How do I meet a girl, a boy, or whatever it, it may be that that person particularly wants in their life? Yeah. People want connection, and it doesn't matter whether you're autistic or not. Where we have a big difference in the autistic community is that a lot of us find it very difficult to communicate with other people. Mm -hmm. Not that we can't communicate, because when we get together with each other or with people who understand where we're coming from, like yourself, mm -hmm. it's very easy to communicate. Yeah. But there are a huge amount of barriers that stop that and as a result you have a lot of very lonely people who've felt so rejected they've in turn rejected back if you don't want me i don't want you and so they appear to be loners they appear to not want it but in reality they really do yeah absolutely yeah no that that's yeah i get that um so i suppose and and i understand that this is a huge question quinn um but mm. what does being autistic mean to you I think like most things in the, the whole subject of autism, it's, it's very much a double-edged sword. There's, there's pros and there's cons. Um, pros, I've, I've certain, it's difficult to say without sounding a bit arrogant, I've certain abilities, which I know I wouldn't have if I weren't autistic, but they're all based around singular focus. We've all heard about hyper-focus in autism and in ADHD. Um, this state, if you like, where we get totally focused on a particular subject or activity and it's very difficult to distract us. Um, that's actually how the name of the channel came out. That, that zone when I'm completely absorbed in something and I'm churning out work at an incredibly fast rate and I'm really pleased with the results. That's what I called the auto, autistomatic zone. Okay. Um, it's kind of like you, your brain working like a well-oiled machine and just producing or remembering or functioning or calculating things incredibly fast mm -hmm. and it's, it's part of the whole spiky skill set of autistic people we all have peaks and troughs within our abilities and those abilities in which we peak we can very often become hyper focused mm -hmm. um i've been lucky enough to have a very good memory for a, a number of different things um i know there's this this cliche about uh, autistic savants and memory for dates and things like that I, I do have a very good memory for loads and loads of things I love the way that I can get absorbed into um, a piece of music or a book or a film and watch it or enjoy it over and over again learning every tiny little intricate detail of it mm -hmm. whereas a lot of people around me would just go oh, why do you want to watch the same thing over and over again don't you get bored of it no because I see new layers every single time and the combination of familiarity and novelty is something quite special to me, but I know a lot of people can't appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, for other levels, when we talk about um, connecting with other people, I don't have a broad group of friends. I've never had this large peripheral group. It's ironic when I've got a channel that actually having lots of followers and subscribers is actually a good thing for me, but I don't crave popularity or fame in any way. I'm yeah. quite content just with having a couple of people I'm very close to, but I am extremely close to those people mm -hmm. and I know them extremely well with, mm -hmm. within tiny intricate detail. But those friendships are so valuable to me and I, I feel blessed if you like to be in that situation of being able to, to to be that close to somebody and feel that bond but that bond is only there because i don't want particularly to bond with too many people and because they've been grateful that i've had that sense of loyalty and care and interest in them so it's, it's, it's got a lot of pros to it but on the other hand there's been a lot of downsides to it um I've been through a lot of bullying in my life. I may seem like I'm quite a, a confident, articulate person right now, but believe you me, I've been bullied mercilessly throughout my life. Yeah. Um, even in, in recent time, you know, in the last few years, I've had to raise bullying and harassment cases in the workplace, which, yep, yeah, they've ended up being in my favor and the people concerned have, you know, had their just desserts, but it's a hell of a fight to deal with. Mm -hmm. And that applies to, every walk of life you find yourself being turned down for jobs or being turned down for promotions um, you find people when they find out you're autistic start making assumptions about you there are sensory difficulties in almost everything you do you know we're all quite annoyed that we can't go to supermarkets at the moment but a supermarket is a really serious sensory assault for myself and a lot of other autistic people the amount of noise the people the, the bustling the smells 
it all can overload the senses quite rapidly. So there are things which maybe aren't um, as welcome, but they come as part of the parcel. And even then, some of them are blessings in disguise. Mm -hmm. My sensitivity to vocal noise means I can easily be overwhelmed by um, large amounts of people talking at once. But on the other hand, if it's just two or three people talking, I can hear all three conversations and follow them quite clearly. So that sensitivity works in both ways, both for me and against me. It depends on the circumstances and the people I'm with at the time. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, um, you've been diagnosed for, for, for quite, quite a while. Um, Quinn, how old were you again when you got your diagnosis? Um, I was just shy of 14 years old. Um, it was 1984 so uh, I was born in 1970 so in the middle of 1970 so it was wow um, I was, bo I was, was born in 19 I was born in 1984 <laughs> just told everybody my age. but yeah but you're so, as old as my diagnosis yeah wow so as a 14 year old boy because I, I do a lot of work Quinn with um young autistic people around that age what was that like as yeah. a 14 year old boy did you know that you were autistic or did somebody have to tell you you were autistic? Or did nobody tell you? Well, th this is the thing that is so different now to back then. Nobody knew anything about it. I mean, remember in, that it wasn't until I think 1992 that um, the uh, DSM, uh, yeah. the Diagnostic, whatever it is, manual, the Diagnostic American manual, anyway. Manual, yep. That, that um, it, was, it was in 92, I believe, that they included um, autism originally as uh, a spectrum condition i think it was 94 for the icd mm -hmm. so at the time there was no framework autism was just seen essentially the same way as it had been uh, when leo canna first described it it was seen as a very serious condition that it affected maybe one in ten thousand mainly boys mm -hmm. um, and that the prospects for somebody who was diagnosed as autistic were pretty grim you could expect a, a, a very poor quality of life, that you were likely to, to not form relationships. The likelihood of you ever working was pretty slim. Yeah. And yet, on the other hand, you had um, Asperger's view of it uh, and his little professors and the like. And so the two were starting to come together at that time. But essentially, it was people like myself. I can stop kicking that tripod. Um, <laughs> people like myself who were first diagnosed that paved the way for the inclusion in the diagnostic manuals in the first place a certain number of people have to be identified mm -hmm. for it to be accepted as valid and then included further on so at the time i was diagnosed there was nothing mm -hmm. there was no internet there was nothing in the libraries um i tried to find things out there was nothing there so what i had was a knowledge that I didn't fit in and that I felt different and that there were things I was being asked to do which seemed utterly pointless to me but I was still expected to do them I was still expected to fit in into a world which I didn't slot into easily yeah. so I knew there was something um, when I was diagnosed like I say the psychologist that diagnosed me was very forward-thinking but there was very little in the way of support that he could give me. There were no support services. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing that was offered to me was uh, that I could go to what they called a special school. Right. But when we looked into it, what it was, was basically Borstal. Right. Um, I was, it was not a school for, for bright kids who didn't work out too well in the school system. It was a school for vandals, arsonists, violent kids, mm -hmm. uh, just to get them out of society. Mm -hmm. And, that wasn't the route we wanted to go down certainly not me um when we actually got the diagnostic letter my family didn't take it well um there was very little knowledge of autism at the time as i say um my father's attitude was no son of mine's gonna have any sort of diagnosis like this there's nothing wrong with you you're just a naughty boy mm -hmm. um tore up the letter and threw it on the open fire that we still had back then mm -hmm. um so it, my family's attitude to it was denial for many years and with the lack of information out there there was not much i could do with it so i had this diagnosis very little information about it no one i could talk to about it when i tried to raise it with uh, my doctor or with my my school because i changed schools at that time because of the problems that i was having there mm -hmm. nobody was interested or knew anything so mm -hmm. it's just well okay yeah you've got this ism thing well we're just gonna treat you the same way 
we're still going to treat you like a naughty boy. But my, my naughtiness was simply that I didn't understand the need to regurgitate things that I'd already been over. I'd, I would get sent out of class for putting my hand up uh, right at the beginning of the lesson and effectively reciting everything the lesson was going to be about, get told I was cheeky and sent out of class, then be told off for not doing homework, which was regurgitating the same information I'd already been through at the beginning of the lesson. So I proved I'd learned it. So what was the point in doing homework? Because they already knew I knew it and yeah. I had better things to do anyway. Mm -hmm. I had books to read. I had spaceships to draw. Um, I had Doctor Who novels to read because that was a huge special interest of mine at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and as time went on, I got to 16 years of age. My school said to me that because I was disruptive, um, that I wasn't welcome back in sixth form. And I left education at that point. And yet it hasn't stopped me learning one bit. Mm -hmm. Everything I've learned has been through personal endeavor. And if you like the classic autodidact, mm -hmm. um, school taught me absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. So when when did things change for you then, Quinn, from that 14-year-old boy of having this label, if you like, and nothing around, no kind of frames of reference to cling on to, when did things start to change for you and you started maybe understanding yourself a little bit more? Was there a time, was there like a pivotal moment that you remember? Certainly, it was the, the, the mid to late 90s, um, 1996 to be precise, um, I got my first PC and uh, AOL trial disc. And I went wow, to AOL! <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> I <laughs> back in the, uh, where you were paying per minute. Yeah, wow. Um, <laughs> but that, that was a revelation to me. Um, as I say, it was uh, the mid 90s, the spectrum had been acknowledged uh, in the manuals for a couple of years. Um, and diagnoses of what we were then referred to exclusively as Asperger syndrome mm -hmm. um, were on the rise. This was the start of the point where um, a few people started talking about an autism epidemic. Um, there were lots and lots of people in their teens and 20s being diagnosed at that time, uh, particularly in the US, because they'd adopted it a few years before. So I, I discovered other people like myself. Mm -hmm. um, for once, instead of feeling like the, the alien abroad, I actually felt like one of the gang. I felt like I'd met people who understood the way my mind worked in a way nobody else ever had. Mm -hmm. And it was an astonishing revelation. Um, what was so awkward about it at the time is that uh, I was married at the time. I, I married um, in my mid-20s. Um, and I never told my wife about my diagnosis because I was scared of her reaction. And what surprises me now as a middle-aged man is how many people who are in the same boat who've actually not told their partners or very close friends or their employers of their diagnosis because they're afraid of the reaction. And for that matter, people who get an adult diagnosis who are then afraid of how people are going to react afterwards. Um, if you look on social media at the, the amount of groups for people who've been late diagnosed, the fear of um, disclosure is quite palpable. Mm -hmm. um, but like I say, I, my wife didn't know. and I, I effectively did all this in secret. I was leading a, a secret life as an online autistic. Um, but it was a revelation finding that a lot of the things that I had difficulty with, other people had difficulty with as well. But on the other hand, there were things that we found straightforward in life that a lot of them did as well mm -hmm. but there were inklings of things which would later become part of the accepted world of autistic people mm -hmm. um, things like sensory differences back then um, sensory overload was something that nobody re really considered or talked about yet we were talking about it we were all saying yeah i get that i get that i have this certain circumstance i feel this certain thing in this um, certain situation um, these particular kinds of noises upset me, these particular kinds of smells, aversions to textures of food, um, tactile problems, things, you know, uh, labels in clothes, for instance, is almost a, a cliche. Mm -hmm. um, one that I, I found that was a, a great revelation to me is having enough room for my toes in shoes. Um, I've worn steel toe capped shoes for as long as I can remember, essentially work boots. Um, but the reason is because I need to be able to wiggle my toes. Yeah. Um, not to be able to do so is 
quite frankly, is infuriating. It's like an itch I can't scratch. Yeah. And to find that there were a couple of other people I was talking to on these IRC channels, Internet Relay Chat, which is kind of the, um, the forerunner of, of social media and messaging apps, but to meet some, somebody else and then several people who all had this same um, need to wiggle their toes and would either not wear shoes at all or specifically wear shoes that they, they had enough toe room in or buying shoes that were too big, for instance, was a, another solution. It was quite a revelation. I'm not the weirdo anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm part of something. I'm, there, there are other people like me out there. And the epiphany that that brought about, it, it did change my life completely. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, if you like, it was the start of what many years later would become um, the, the YouTube channel, etc. But I think a combination of my will to do it and the technology to do it had to catch up with the ideas I had going around in my head. But yeah, it was quite yeah. a remarkable time. If it weren't for that, I probably still would feel I was in the dark. So that's, yeah, I can imagine that feeling of actually people around you getting it for the first time and being able to resonate with what you were saying. That must have been so powerful um, because we all need yeah. community. We all need to be part of communities that understand us. Um, I mean, we get a lot of adults, Quinn, that have been diagnosed much later on in life. Would you, because yeah. some of the advice that I always give them is try and connect where possible with other autistic adults or other autistic people, yeah. um, depending on the age, because I just think that is, that is so important, isn't it, to be part of the, commun the community. Um, I think that goes yeah. a long way to start understanding yourself being around other people other autistic people would you, would you agree with that from what, what without you're... a doubt um yeah. it, it does make a huge difference connecting with other people of a like mind um are you familiar with um with plato's cave yeah yeah uh, yeah well you know the whole analogy from that that uh, is somebody who lives in a cave and they see the world as shadows on a wall mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but when they actually see the real world it's an immense revelation that their, their minds are literally blown by how much more there is to see what there is to be. Yeah. and some people may not even um believe it because it's mm -hmm. so different to what they're used to i think first off being diagnosed is a huge revelation itself but then finding that there are other people who actually think like you when you felt like an alien for however many years of your life it really does completely change your world mm -hmm. um when I, when I started the, the channel, the, the very second video I did was on that topic. And somebody asked me um, to expand on that, to go beyond just what to, to expect in terms of the reactions of other people and uh, how to go about disclosing to how it feels. Um, and I just used the old um, RGB um, acronym that you know, we all know, red, green and blue for um, pixels and TVs and monitors and the like. But RGB was relief, grief, and belief. Three processes that most people go through once they're diagnosed. There's the relief of knowing they're not a freak, that they're not the only one like them. There's often grief for the life that they've left behind that they feel they may never get. Mm -hmm. But then there's belief. And that last stage belief, that really comes from engaging with other people like yourself. Mm -hmm. There are so many communities out there um, whether it's Facebook groups or whether it's uh, hashtags on Twitter or Instagram and the like, there are so many like-minded people and there are plenty of people like myself. I mean, you know, I know obviously when I talk about um, my work, that's because I did it. I know it really well, but there are dozens of other autistic YouTubers that I watch regularly who produce really good content. Yeah. Um, we all cover similar topics, but in our own ways, mine is generally very measured i try to go for high production values and i try to be very calm about it some people are very very passionate about it mm -hmm. um, but we're all essentially trying to to get across the same point that yeah. we're not alone that the world may not be made for us but we can work in this world we can survive in this world and we can be part of it mm -hmm. um, the biggest message overall is that in order for that to happen there needs to be a bit of give both ways 